You're listening to a podcast from the South China Morning Post. Hello, and welcome to the China Geopolitics Podcast. I'm Chad Bray here in the newsroom of the South China Morning Post in Hong Kong. This week, we saw China achieve a series of historic firsts, which all have had an impact on world geopolitics in some way. The first was the celebration of the first Chinese woman in space. Of course, she wasn't the first woman in space. That title belongs to Russian cosmonaut Valentina Tereshkova in 1963. But it was a big PR moment for China's space program when taikonaut Wang Yiping joined the crew aboard the Tiangong space station earlier this week and went on her first spacewalk. The second was a report claiming China had successfully tested a space vehicle which could fly into space and return. Now, this vehicle was initially reported by the FT as being a hypersonic missile capable of carrying a nuclear payload, meaning it could hit targets anywhere on the planet. And this, of course, generated a lot of Cold War-style commentary. Funnily enough, some people were calling this a Sputnik moment. But since that report, Beijing's foreign ministry spokesman, Zhai Lijian, has denied it was a weapon, saying it was a, quote, routine test of space vehicle, end quote. It just didn't get the same publicity as a female taikonaut in space. And third, the PLA Navy made some history of its own with the Russian Navy when a bunch of its ships sailed right between Japan's main island of Honshu with its northern island of Hokkaido. We're going to talk with our correspondent who lives on the island of Honshu in Tokyo about how Japan's prime minister responded to this, given he's only been in the job three weeks and how it's playing in the lead up to the election he's called in nine days time. And in the second half of our podcast, we're going to hear a feature interview with a former Australian prime minister. Now, Joe Biden might have trouble remembering the name of the current Australian prime minister, who I'm told is referred to by the Aussies as Scotty for marketing. But China certainly remembers Kevin Rudd as the first Western leader ever who could speak fluent Mandarin Chinese. He was actually prime minister twice, once for three years in 2007, and again briefly in 2013, in what counts for the Thunderdome that is the Australian political system. But for the past six years, he's been the president of a New York-based think tank known as the Asia Society Policy Institute. He's also been a very public contributor to the ongoing discussion about China's relationship, not only with Australia, but with the US, and now it seems the UK following the announcement of the AUKUS agreement. What does this agreement mean? Does it increase the threat of war? And what kind of war might that be? A hot one or a cold one? Strap yourself to the mast, look out for the albatrosses, and let's set sail for Japan. Julian Rael is a correspondent for the South China Morning Post in Tokyo. He joins us now. Uh, Julian, welcome. Uh, Hello there. Hi. Uh, Julian, let's start with the big story this week. China and Russia sailed their naval ships through a strait near Japan. It's the first time in history Was this a surprise? And when was the first time that you heard about this? I think this did catch everyone off guard. The Chinese and the Russian navies and air forces have been doing a lot more in the way of joint training in the last few years. But they've never done something as provocative as this. Um, The navies have been operating in the Sea of Japan uh, for the last three or four years. And uh, these are regular drills. There's nothing out of the ordinary in, in that respect. But instead of going their separate ways, as they have done in the past, and the Russians go back to Vladivostok and the Chinese fleet heads south and goes between the narrow straits between the southern tip of the Korean peninsula and Japan and then back into uh, into the East China Sea, Moscow and Beijing appear to have made the deliberate decision to have a bit of a poke at Japan, if you like. So they've sent this 10-strong fleet through the uh, Tsugaru Strait. The strait is... Uh, international waters through a technicality, but it is between the very northern tip of the main island of Honshu, which is Japanese territory, obviously, and the equally Japanese territory of Hokkaido. So they've sailed through this territory and out into the Pacific. Clearly, they're being monitored all the way. But yes, it's provocative. It's the first time they've done it. But I've been talking to analysts over the last few days, and they're saying now they've done it once, they're likely to do it again. And could you sort of give our our listeners a a bit of a a lesson on sort of how big an area this is? Because not everyone's familiar with uh, Japan's geography. 
Of course. So the straits between uh, Hokkaido and Japan's most northerly prefecture and Honshu, the main island, is only is less than 20 kilometers wide. So they've sailed through this, this very narrow strait um, and out into the Pacific. This strait, Japan has the right to claim 12 nautical miles from its uh, sea, seashore as its territorial waters. So technically, they could have in the past have claimed this entirely as Japanese territorial waters. They didn't. Back in the Cold War years, Japan wanted to leave a very narrow strip of uh, navigable water between the two islands to allow American warships to travel through there. Japan's a little bit hamstrung. Um, it still sticks to its um, policy of not developing, not deploying, or not allowing any nuclear weapons onto its territory. That's clearly a hangover from uh, 1945, the nuclear bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But to allow American fleets or American naval uh, warships to operate, they had to be able to travel through this narrow gap between Honshu and Hokkaido. So that's why we've got this strip of sea that anyone can now navigate. The Chinese and the Russians have clearly noticed this loophole and are going to exploit it to the utmost. And uh, right now, uh, are, are there U.S. And, and, and U.K. ships in the area? I know we've had a lot of operations by uh, various carrier groups in, in recent weeks in the South China Sea. There are constantly American uh, units in the area. Um, there are major, major uh, naval bases at Sasebo in Nagasaki Prefecture and at Yokosuka, which is just due south of Tokyo. So, yes, the Americans are here. And, of course, they've got a, a major presence in, in Okinawa as well. So they're here and they're constantly exercising with their uh, Japanese counterparts. The Brits were here earlier in the year, as you, suggest, as you said. Uh, HMS Queen Elizabeth and her support fleet um, was in Japan. Um, they also docked at Yokosuka briefly. And they've been carrying out similarly exercises with uh, the Japanese units, South Korean units, and alongside the Americans as well. The uh, Brits, I understand, have left the area. They were in the South China Sea last I heard, um, and they are sort of moving away. But I also hear that uh, there are two British warships heading this way, and they're going to be stationed here pretty much permanently. They're smaller coastal uh, patrol craft more than anything, but clearly the UK wants to fly the flag in this part of the world on a, on a semi-permanent basis. And this comes just three weeks into the term of, of the new Japanese prime minister. And, you know, it's, it's a major, unprecedented, and frankly, a national security issue to handle. So what was his response? No question. Um, the Chinese and the Russians may very well have been interested in testing the new prime minister, Mr. Kishida, just to see what his response was going to be. Naturally, he's a bit of a dove. That's his bailiwick, if you like. But the sense in Japanese politics is that he is something of a puppet of a uh, prime minister who's gone before him, Shinzo Abe, who is far more of a hawk. Kishida got in because Mr. Abe threw his support behind him in the leadership election. And the sense is that uh, Kishida owes uh, Mr. Abe uh, uh, an awful lot and will therefore follow his line. Given that, uh, Mr. Abe's uh, hawkish tendencies, it seems that uh, Mr. Kishida is towing the line. And I think it was on Wednesday of this week, he, he came out and said that Japan is going to be looking quite carefully at developing the ability to strike an enemy base if Japanese intelligence is of the mind of a threat is imminent to Japan. This is something that Mr. Abe has said in the past, uh, but it is quite an aggressive move that Japan will have the uh, ability to attack any country that it senses is preparing a, a missile or some other sort of attack against Japanese interests. So, yeah, he put his foot down somewhat there. Quite how it's going to turn out if he's if push comes to shove, we'll have to wait and see. I also believe that the Chinese are likely to continue testing uh, Japanese patients around the disputed islands in the East China Sea. So another potential flashpoint there. And we've heard uh, Mr. Kishida's response, but what about the Japanese media? What's been sort of the general reaction to, to what the prime minister said as well as to the situation? I think support. Uh, the Japanese public and the Japanese media are very much on board uh, with the sense that uh, Japan needs to defend its territories, defend its ocean and land territories. The Senkakos are known in, uh, known in China as the Daoyo Islands, I believe. That is, you know, in the forefront of everybody's minds. Um, there's a major presence down there. Uh, the Japanese Coast Guard is in a constant uh, cat and mouse game, it seems, with the uh, with the Chinese Coast Guard, and it looks like the Chinese seem to be expanding the area in which they, they hope to test uh, the Japanese forces. 
um, to the very far north of Japan now. I was speaking to an analyst in the week, and he was saying um, Tokyo is extremely concerned. The defense ministry is extremely concerned now that Chinese warships are entering the Pacific to the north of Japan and then almost completing a circle around the Japanese archipelago before going back into uh, the East China Sea or Chinese territorial waters there. That's primarily because, obviously, they're the big Japanese cities and most of the major military bases are on the east coast of Japan, so on the Pacific side. And uh, the Chinese are inching, if you like, ever closer and developing a blue water navy capability. And just at the end of this month, we're going to have the uh, general elections in Japan. So how is this sort of playing out in, in terms of the election? You know, in the, in the U.S., we would be used to seeing a lot of sort of hawks banging on this ahead of an election. Nobody wants a war. Nobody wants a conflict. I think the status quo is how Japan would like it to remain and the Japanese people as well. But at the same time, there is a sense that amongst Japanese people that China is being um, constantly more pushy, more demanding. Japanese people, they look at the situation in Taiwan, in the South China Sea, on the border with India, and there are these constant frictions um, and they're all reported extensively in the Japanese media. And that makes Japanese people very nervous. Essentially, parts of Japan, you, you could say the Senkaku Islands and Okinawa are almost on the front line against any sort of Chinese aggression. Um, so, yes, there is a good deal of, uh, of concern here. And I think that will translate in the election into more support for the Liberal Democratic Party. The opposition has problems of its own, and it doesn't seem to be as united or capable of it in many ways of dealing with foreign security threats. It hasn't had the experience. It hasn't been in power for many, many years. So I think one of the, the, the planks of the uh, ruling LDP's political platform as it goes into this election at the end of the month, is that only this party, only the ruling LDP, has the experience and the uh, capability to actually face down uh, a rival in the area if the time comes. Yeah. And in previous years in, in Japan, we, we've seen, you know, protests surrounding Article 9 of the Japanese Constitution with tens of thousands of people gathering in favor of, of the peace clause. But you know, we have lots of naval ships from the U.S., from the U.K. They're, they're coming in and around Japan. Japan is participating in maritime exercises with the Quad. Has this, you know, sparked any renewed concerns among the public regarding Article 9? I think people are more concerned about China making a grab for the Senkaku Islands. I think uh, there has been very little talk in the last couple of years about the Constitution needing to be uh, reformed to make Japan more powerful. I think the LDP still have it as a plank of their uh, of their policy, and they would very much like it. But I think the Japanese people would simply like to ensure security of Japanese territory and waters. They're not looking to provoke China, but purely to to defend what Japan decide or what Japan believes is its territories and, and rights. I don't see. I mean, there there have been protests in Okinawa in, in recent months. But that's primarily to do with the move of the uh, U.S. Uh, Marines base to a new site in the prefecture. It's more of a, a localized issue rather than a, than a general uh, nationwide concern. And uh, another issue that uh, you know we want to sort of pivot to within this and, and sort of how this plays in the overall uh, debate that's going on around Japan and, and its future is carbon neutrality in 2050. We've got a push right now to, to really try to reduce carbon emissions. There's talk of uh, restarting the country's nuclear plants following the Fukushima incident a decade ago. You know, how does the prime minister go about juggling uh, the country's carbon commitments with the you know, very public opposition to restarting nuclear plants? I think they're going to use uh, the majority that they are almost certain to win in the general election at the end of the month to push ahead with restarting the nuclear industry here. I think there are less than 10 reactors in the country that are operational. A lot are being shut down because they were towards the end of their lives uh, when the earthquake happened in, in March 2011. And uh, they've been shut down for safety reasons aren't, and are never going to start up again. But the target that the, the government has set for its carbon commitment is very ambitious. And the government's position is that there is no way to meet that commitment without resorting to nuclear. If you talk to opponents of nuclear, they say that's tosh. Um, there are plenty of renewable options in Japan from geothermal through solar, through wave, through offshore wind. Uh, you know, there are plenty of options here. 
Yet the energy hawks in the Japanese government are pushing very, very hard. And uh, the, the cabinet that Mr. Kishida named is strongly in favour of nuclear power. And it, clearly that's the direction that he's being pushed in. Fukushima will never be restarted. And there are plenty of other plants around the country that will never be up and running again. But many will. And uh, the debate now, even in the leadership election for the head of the LDP a month ago, the debate was the old plants that Japan has relied on until now are not going to reopen. Therefore, we have to find an alternative. And the debate is that it is now time to look at small scale, very modern, uh, much more capable. And they are emphasizing the fact that these are far safer because the technology is far newer, uh, nuclear plants. And that is one thing that certainly they're going to be looking at. And, you know, within that, Japan, frankly, like uh, China, is a big user of coal still for a lot of power production. So is this the step to try to step away from coal? Yeah, I think it is. Japan had to go back to the fossil fuels after after Fukushima, after 2011. They've been trying to wean themselves off that. And the answer that the, the government comes up with each time is nuclear. That much to the dismay of the you know, of, of the green power lobby, that seems to be the way they're going. Japan's energy utilities have invested billions, clearly, in, in the nuclear sector, and they have very strong links with politicians. They tend to be liberal with the money that gets thrown around at uh, election times. So uh, clearly, their influence is important, and they seem to have won the day in terms of the argument whether Japan should go more to renewables or go back to nuclear. Julian, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, we'll look forward to uh, uh, following your updates on SEMP.com. Take care. Thank you very much. Just before we get back to geopolitics, let me tell you about this week's Global Impact Newsletter and a story that I've been following quite closely. This week's Global Impact Newsletter is focusing on China Evergrande Group. It's the biggest home builder by sales in China, and it's also the world's most indebted developer. Much of the world is watching right now to see whether or not Evergrande is going to default on billions of dollars of bonds that it has sold to offshore investors. It's so far paid its onshore investors, but there are big concerns because it has a huge amount of debt that's sitting there, more than $300 billion worth. This week's Global Impact Newsletter is going to take a deep dive into it and give you the information you need to understand the situation. Look for it in your inboxes, and if you're not subscribed, click on SEMP.com and hit the subscription button. So we have a special feature interview for you this week with thanks to our video team here at the SEMP. They've just launched a fortnightly new talk program on SEMP.com. It's called Talking Post, where SEMP Chief News Editor Yandan Latu speaks with some of the major newsmakers from around the world as well as here in Hong Kong. The latest episode features former Australian Prime Minister Kevin Rudd, who continues to contribute analysis and policy critiques of the Australian-China relationship since his time in power. Here's the interview in full. Kevin Rudd, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, you were the Australian Prime Minister between 2007 and 2013, and uh, that was a time I remember when you uh, spoke about uh, a true friendship, building a true friendship with China. Uh, there was a lot of positivity back then. There was a lot of uh, outward-looking, uh, you know, the, the mentality was like that. It was about reaching out. It was about friendship. All of that has changed drastically over the past few years, especially. What happened in your assessment? Can you encapsulate that for us? What went wrong? Why, why did we all go downhill from that point? Well, I think it's important not to see it as going wrong, but what changed? Um, and I think two or three things have changed. The first thing is um, since 2012-13, uh, 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 China has changed. Uh, China's uh, domestic politics have changed, China's economic policy direction has changed, China's uh, attitude to uh, the assertion of its international policy interests has changed, and we see, therefore, a different substance and style to China's uh, diplomacy and, if you like, its power projection around the world. The second thing that changed in the period since then, of course, is the uh, binary state of the US-China relationship. Uh, this became most acute under Trump uh, with the trade war, but has continued through the trade war to the present uh, in the Biden administration, this new age of strategic competition. So that's a change. And the third is in Australia, 
uh, with the election of the Conservative government in Australia in late 13, early 14. And there is often a predisposition on the part of Australian Conservatives to, as it were, uh, play to uh, Washington and London uh, rather than to uh, deal with the realities and complexities of the region. It's been an enduring thematic in Australian foreign policy history. So if you ask what's changed, I think there have been three big variables at work, um, but we live in challenging times. Well, let's talk about Australia's role in all this and, of course, uh, uh, Australia's uh, new partnership with the uh, US and the UK, uh, this new uh, arrangement they call AUKUS, and uh, the uh, transfer of nuclear technology, nuclear submarines uh, to Australia. I want to ask how much of this, when we talk about uh, the, the upsetting the balance of power in this part of the world uh, and uh, all the uh, alarmist talk about uh, nuclear war, cold war, confrontation between China and Australia, how much of that is reality and how much of it is, at the end of the day, we're talking about arms sales, the business of arms sales, which the US uh, you know, is, is a major player in, the main player, you might say. And uh, people could look at it this way, which is uh, Afghanistan. The U.S. is done with Afghanistan. 20 years of war there. War is a, is, is a profit-based industry. And uh, the U.S. Uh, military-industrial complex has made a lot of money there. But that's over. They've pulled out of Afghanistan. Uh, the mess that you have there, we can debate that forever. But that, has, that is over. Also, the U.S. still needs to sell arms. So primarily, are we being alarmist when we talk about the upping the ante in the region to a dangerous level? Or this is, should we just look at this as this is the U.S. just selling arms again and it's found a new partner to do it to? at the expense of its existing partner like France, you might say? Well, I think if you looked at the aggregate balance of military power in East Asia and the West Pacific, US armed forces in the region have basically remained constant in size and in deployment and in sophistication. Uh, what's changed actually is the rapid expansion of the PLA, uh, the Navy, the Air Force, uh, as well as, of course, uh, a whole range of paramilitary vessels which are currently active in the South China Sea. Aircraft carrier developments, um, the expansion of China's SSN and SSBN fleets, the modernization of Chinese rocket forces. So this is a new dynamic. I make no observation of whether it's um, justified or not. I'm simply being an analyst. A further dynamic, of course, has been increased um, military expenditure by Japan third largest economy in the world, and when Japan decides to increase its outlays, obviously you have uh, much more by way of uh, military activity around the region as well. So I think that's the strategic environment in which uh, we find this most recent debate about AUKUS occurring. The second point would be this. I think you're right to be uh, sceptical about the strategic significance of AUKUS, because when you unpack it all and look at its essence, it's essentially a defence procurement agreement. Um, and uh, there is no mutual defence pact here. That already exists between Australia and the United States and has been since 1951. Uh, and there is no mutual defence pact between the United Kingdom and Australia uh, under AUKUS or anything else. This is a defence procurement agreement purely about this, the provision of certain nuclear propulsion technologies. So we need to put this into context. Finally, however, um, in terms of uh, whether US strategy towards uh, China in the region uh, is driven by the so-called military industrial complex, I don't think that's accurate at all. Um, for the simple reason is if you're familiar with the evolution of US strategic doctrine on China, uh, particularly in the period since 2017, it's basically been uh, derived from the US analysis of the changing structure and sophistication of the Chinese um, uh, military apparatus and changes in China's declaratory policy. We can have a separate debate about whether the American response is fully appropriate or not, but I think it's wrong analysis to say it's driven by the defense dollar. Well, if you, if you look at, uh, I mean, a lot of the talk is, uh, and, and you just uh, uh, touched upon that as well, which is a lot of it is the response to how China is uh, dealing in the uh, behaving, behaving, I keep hearing this, behavior of China. Uh, de behaving in the South China Sea uh, in terms of the militarization and, uh, you know, the expansion of its territory or, or claims that it lays to its territory, etc. So a lot of that, uh, we, we talk about China's behavior and uh, China's neighbors merely reacting to the way China is building up its military. 
and its presence in the South China Sea. But can you also look at it from China's point of view in terms of uh, the number of military bases there, hundreds, the U.S. and its allies? There, it's, 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 when, you, when you look at it, you have a bird's eye view of it, it's almost like China is surrounded and is under a state of siege. And then you couple this with the constant rhetoric and dialogue about China must behave, China must do this, China must do that, China is a threat, etc. But when you talk about the threat from China, in the, in the last 30 years or so, China has not fought a hot war. It has not waged war. It has not invaded uh, any country with a military force and, and uh, started bombing the population. And, and the, the countries that accuse China of being a threat or are alarmed by China's threat those countries have been actively involved in wars, including your own. So uh, from the Chinese point of view, can you see how this lectures on how it must behave? Otherwise, its neighbors do have a right to defend themselves and protect themselves in this manner. Uh, I'm not in the business of providing anyone with a public lecture. I'm simply being an analyst. Sure. Uh, because I run a think tank, that's what I do. Uh, and I analyze change. Um, firstly, the, the Chinese strategic perspective is exactly... Uh, as you've described. In fact, I detailed this in an extensive lecture to the West Point um, uh, Military Academy in the United States a couple of years ago, outlining Xi Jinping's worldview, looking at uh, how they sense that they are bottled in on their eastern maritime periphery and, uh, and China's uh, expansion, therefore, through the Belt and Road Initiative, through its western continental periphery. Um, and therefore, when China looks at its maritime history, particularly since the Opium Wars, uh, China has a particular view of its exposure um, to uh, the great powers, the colonial powers, the neo-colonial powers, the Japanese occupation, not just through Manchuria, but also in maritime operations into Shanghai and along the Chinese coast. These are all factors shaping China's current strategic posture and China's current strategic um, aspirations, including what remains a maritime uh, preoccupation with how to recover Taiwan to Chinese national sovereignty. So those are all givens. However, uh, in the real world of strategic analysis, perceptions is one thing, actual military deployments and changes in those deployments are another. And what has happened by way of change in the last five to seven years is A, China reclaimed seven islands in the South Pacific and then, despite assurances to the contrary, then militarise them. That's the first change. Uh, the second is in the East China Sea, uh, after the Japanese changed the status quo by nationalising Sankoku Gyaudao and turning them into Japanese sovereign territory, China then for the first time began deploying large numbers of aircraft and uh, vessels into the surrounding EEZ and then declared an air defence identification zone in the in the uh, East China Sea. And thirdly, on the Sino-Indian border, most analysts would agree that in fact what we're looking at um, is uh, China having uh, moved effectively through a series of operations. The uh, line of control uh, between Delhi and Beijing uh, in the two disputed areas uh, of the Sino-Indian border. And so as a consequence, the argument which military analysts would say is that in these three domains, China has changed the status quo. Um, as you could argue also, the United States and its allies changed the status quo after 1945. But we should not pretend that this is, as it were, a static environment. It's changing and therefore one change gives rise to another set of changes. Let's go back to Australia again. Um, Australia has a bit of a delicate balancing act, and that's what it's been dealing with for a long time now, walking a fine line between uh, confronting China or containing China or, or countering uh, the, the perceived threats from China, and also being loyal to its traditional Western allies. And somehow, during your government's time as well, when uh, the belligerence was not so high, you were able to, to manage this. Uh, right now, how, how do they do this? Because you're, you're, you're reliant, uh, your country is reliant on China for trade, uh, and you can see the impact already from the uh, trade punishment that uh, China is meeting out uh, due to Australia's uh, uh, you know, increased uh, friendship with the U.S. Uh, to the extent that it was also asking for a COVID inquiry. Uh, we, can, we don't have to debate that, but whether that was justified or not. But what I mean is, in terms of all that, and considering uh, the balance of power, uh, considering the need for peace in this region, uh, not we've, we're already in a state of cold war, let's say, between uh, the US and, and China, and not making it worse. How does Australia 
walk this very fine line? Well, firstly, I dispute the fact that we are currently in a Cold War. Uh, the feature, the uh, defining features of a Cold between, War... Between the US and uh, China? Uh, not Australia. I'm not talking about Australia yet. The US and China. No, I'm, I'm about to say we are not in a Cold War yet between China and the United States. The Cold War between the Soviet Union and the United States had the following characteristics. Living on a nuclear precipice against each other, a rolling daily um, ideological war, Thirdly, zero economic engagement. Um, and two of those three factors are not present at present. The ideological divide is there is some decoupling on the economy occurring, but the enmeshment of the two economies is still significant. And we do not have daily threats of mutual nuclear annihilation. So people need to be very careful about the loose use of the term Cold War. I believe there is a trend in that direction, but we are a long way off it yet. Secondly, all American allies in East Asia um, have a, a parallel dilemma to Australia's, uh, whether it's the Republic of Korea, whether it's Japan, whether it's uh, the Republic of the Philippines, whether it's uh, the Kingdom of Thailand, whether it's Australia. And non-allies like India face it as well, which is principal economic partner because of China's economic size is Beijing um, and the security partner uh, of uh, choice, usually through allied arrangements, is the United States. So Australia is not Robinson Crusoe here. Third point is that in terms of the management, however, of Australia's strategic interests, my argument has always been that we need to balance both our continued military collaboration with the United States, who have been close allies of ours for about 100 years, uh, at the same time deepening our diplomatic and economic engagement with all countries within the region. Uh, if I have a critique in terms of the posture of the current Australian government, uh, it emphasises the first and does not emphasise the second. I am concerned, for example, that Australia's current engagement with Southeast Asia is not as strong as it was in previous periods of Australian governments. When you're talking about, uh, you said there is, uh, you don't see uh, a Cold War in existence right now. Uh, what about the threat of a real war? Given this latest deal uh, uh, with Australia uh, and uh, the, uh, the tensions now in the Western alliance, um, China's uh, very strong position on uh, Taiwan, etc. Do, do you see the potential for things to escalate and actually get out of control with or without this Cold War as a preamble? It depends entirely what time frame we're looking at. If you're looking at the 2020s over the course of the next decade, I think the probability of a hot war between China and the United States is limited. Um, limited in terms of the intentionality of either side. China is not seeking to go to war with the United States over Taiwan, nor is the United States seeking to go to war with China over Taiwan. That may change as China's relative military position against the United States improves. And perhaps by decade's end, China concludes that its military capacity to uh, take Taiwan by force will be sufficiently large to dissuade the Americans from militarily engaging in the first place, or if they do so, uh, that China would then be confident that they would prevail. What is the danger in the 2020s is conflict not by intention or design, but conflict by accident. Yes. And that is an incident creating that. So therefore, we need to be vigilant about that, particularly all the variables at play, collisions in the air, collisions at sea, but also what I describe as political collisions, particularly if after 2024 you end up with a much stronger pro-independentist uh, government under the DPP in Taiwan, uh, that, would add, that would add a new uncontrollable variable in the equation. So we need to build what I describe as strategic guardrails in the China-US relationship so that um, unanticipated events can be managed on the way through rather than simply becoming triggers for a wider conflagration. It certainly occurred, for example, if we're students of history, back in 1914. When we talk about Australia's uh, strategic interests here and the action it does need to take vis-a-vis uh, -vis what actions China is taking, etc., in the South China Sea, that's on one level. On the other level, when we're talking about uh, Australia actually engaging in the, in the details 
uh, uh, of uh, matters such as, say, Hong Kong, for example, Australia recently, or, or some time back now, um, talked about offering safe haven to Hong Kongers in danger, uh, to uh, warning its citizens in Hong Kong to watch out for this uh, national security law that's in effect here. Now, I live in Hong Kong, and I have a pretty good idea of how this national security work law works, and also in the context of what happened here in 2019, when you had utter a anarchy and violence on the streets and all kinds of stuff that went on. So. Australia, on the one hand, while protecting its strategic interests, how do you see its involvement in, in the nitty-gritty of uh, you know, arguments between the US and China, where Hong Kong is often used uh, as a little uh, middle point where you can talk about, look at human rights in Hong Kong, et cetera. How much of that is actually important to Australia? Well, Australia is a liberal democracy, um, and Australia is not alone in that. The posture of Australia on these questions of uh, liberal democracy and the universality of human rights proceeds um, also uh, from the Universal Declaration on Human Rights of 1948, which all countries in the region have signed and have ratified, including China. And secondly, it proceeds from the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights of 1967, which all countries in the region have signed, although in China's case not yet ratified. And so we would simply anchor our position on what those two international covenants say, uh, as opposed to a subjective view held by a particular uh, Western government at a particular time. I think the other thing to bear in mind is that uh, the reason we have a human rights council in Geneva is that it's created under international law, not by the Americans, not by the Australians, not by the Russians, not by anybody else, to uphold those two conventions. And so when you see the matters that you've just referred to uh, being taken up in the HRC, that's the forum which international law was used to create uh, those bodies in the first place. And again, I think it's uh, probably not accurate to pinpoint Australian critiques as being uniquely Australian. They come from Canada, they come from the United States, they come from New Zealand, they come from uh, Japan. Uh, they also come from virtually every member state of the European Union and other democracies as well. So therefore, there is always going to be tension on this question in terms of a classical Chinese communist view of rights and a one-party state uh, and its view that, uh, uh, that rights should always be subject to the power of the ruling party versus a universalist view of rights anchored in this international treaty law. So you're going to have this as a continuing structural tension. Yeah, that's what's happening in Hong Kong right now as well. That's exactly the same uh, debate going on in Hong Kong. Kevin, what do you think of the role of the media in all this in terms of uh, helping people to understand stuff or exacerbating the situation? I mean, for example, uh, with the Hong Kong reporting, uh, we had a lot of problems with uh, Western media reporting, very uh, black and white, with no acknowledgement whatsoever of the many shades of grey and other colours uh, in between. Uh, you've clashed a lot with... Uh, th this is uh, uh, an issue that uh, bothers you as well with the Murdoch media, right? Well, in the business of international relations, you're always going to have problem in terms of uh, foreign newspapers and foreign media organisations reporting local nuance. Um, it's just a problem. Um, and, um, and so you would have had a lot of international reporting, for example, about the popular reaction in Hong Kong back to the original umbrella movement of 2014 through to uh, the more recent actions in 2019 over the uh, Hong Kong government's efforts to change the extradition law. Uh, and we saw what happened as a result of that. You saw Beijing's reaction to that. You saw the national security law being implemented. And you've now seen a series of uh, actions taken against individuals in Hong Kong. Um, the bottom line is you will only have a certain amount of that covered, as it were, in the international media. And the reality which all countries face is they'll take the big topics and the big headlines and they will not take the smaller stories and the smaller headlines which deal with people's day-to-day -day lives. That's just reality. We could all wish it was different, but that's just reality. But the truth is, in Hong Kong, things have changed. The national security law is new. It's a new reality. Um, and therefore, as a consequence, when you have individuals, uh, whether it's uh, newspaper proprietors or Hong Kong uh, democratic activists who are charged and in some cases convicted, uh, of offences. That is new. That was not the way Hong Kong was several years ago. So therefore, because it's new, it constitutes news and therefore it will be covered. Um, on the broader question of the degree of, um, as it were, effective 
political, personal, economic liberty in, in Hong Kong now compared with the past. And of course, you're going to have a, a wide range of views as to how ordinary people's lives have changed or not. All right, I'm afraid we've reached the end of our time here, so uh, we'll have to uh, end it here. Thank you very much for your time and for sharing your expertise and wisdom. Much appreciated. Thank you. It's good to be with you. That was Kevin Rudd featuring on our weekly video talk show, Talking Post. You can find that interview as well as all the other guests featured each fortnight on scmp.com. And I guess if no one else has any other missiles, hypersonic gliders, rocket ships, enterprises, or other vehicles to launch, that's all we have for you this week. For all of you geopolitics, history nerds, and frankly, people who were alive and cared about it at the time, today is the 60th anniversary of the beginning of the Cuban Missile Crisis. That's when President John F. Kennedy announced that U.S. reconnaissance planes had discovered Soviet nuclear weapons in Cuba, and he was ordering what he called a naval quarantine of Cuba. There was a reason he said quarantine. If you use the word blockade, it was legally defined as an act of war. This crisis took a month to resolve, and it's seen as the closest the world ever came to an all-out, all-consuming nuclear war. Of course, now we've got nuclear-armed nations communicating via Twitter. So what could possibly go wrong? We'll keep you up to date with everything happening inside China and around the rest of the world with the latest news and the best analysis at scmp.com. I'm at Chad Bray. And as one famous Cuban once said, What prevails in every corner of this globalized world is the real struggle of our species for its own survival. Bye for now, duck and cover.